turn off the house lights and just a tad. Be Thank you. Hey, we're, it's Fourth of July weekend or week, I should say, and so with that, uh, whenever that rolls around, we talk a lot about in our country. We talk about the country. We talk about the future. We talk about where we've been. We talk about where we're going. And uh, we've been talking about that a lot the last few days. Uh, many of you have been having conversations with your TVs, I'm sure, haven't you? Um, depending on who you're watching, uh, some of you like to watch the people that, you know, you look at them and you hear them and you're like, yes, 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 you're exactly right. Some of you watch other people and you totally disagree with them and you yell at the TV and you know, all those kind of things. And we have all kinds of debates and we debate whether it's, you know, Republican or Democrat or Independent. Um, whether we should have national health care, no health care, uh, the 1%, the 99%. We, we, we debate all kinds of different things. And uh, in, in times like this, um, it's important for people like me who are pastors to kind of take off the pastor hat and I think put on a prophet hat and to be able to speak when, when things like this kind of intersect with the scriptures. And so we want to talk about that this morning. Not anything political, but simply uh, from what we're talking about is we have all these debates, and here's what I want to talk about this morning. There is a debate that's going on in our country that is, it's not at the surface, it's, it's below the surface. And it's bubbling up, and eventually they'll come to the surface. But it is kind of at the core of all the tension that we feel. It's kind of at the core of all the debates that we have. And uh, I'll talk about what that is kind of a little bit later, but first I want to set it up. And basically it is, is, it's the search for a national conscience, okay? A search for a national conscience. Let's just say those two words together, national conscience. Okay, let's say it together. National conscience. Now, we all know what it is to have a conscience. We all have a, 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 our personal conscience. It's that thing inside of us that says, you ought to do this or you ought not to do that. Here's the ought to's. Here are the are not to. And we're all born with a conscience, and then our mama comes along, or other people come along, and they put other things into that conscience. Now, you can ignore your conscience long enough that sooner or later it gets quieter. It, it, what happens to your conscience, it's like a guitar player. When they play the guitar enough, what happens to the end of their fingertips is they develop what? Calluses. Calluses, exactly right. And eventually, if you ignore your conscience long enough, and you figure, is, I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't care what my conscience comes along and says I ought or ought not to do is. You will develop a callous conscience or a seared conscience. The Bible talks about that. Sometimes we find people and you look at people and you think, how did they ever do that to somebody? You know, somebody will murder somebody or rape somebody or whatever the case may be. And you hear them interview later on or whatever. And they have no, what, conscience about it. You think, how does that happen? It happens because that, that's what happens. When you ignore your conscience long enough, you get a seared conscience. Now, here's what we don't think about. Is that we have an individual conscience, but we also have a collective conscience as well. When it comes to a family or a business or an organization, a lot of times at your business or your organization, they call, they call it what? The corporate what? Culture. And it's those things that we ought and ought not to do. Okay? You also have that in your family. Here's how you really know it. Maybe you remember this as a kid, or maybe you've done this as a family. You go to somebody's house, and uh, you're there, not there very long, and what you find is, is if one of the others, you'll find this here, is, is you'll, you'll hear an adult talking to another adult, and you're like, man, adults in our, our, our house... They don't talk to one another like that. They don't use that quite that quite language, or you know, we don't let our kids do this, or our kids do that, or whatever the case may be. And what happens is, you get back in the car and you kind of all look at each other, and you're like, "Oh man, we do our family different than they do their family, right?" Because you have a collective conscience, not because you sat there and you wrote it all down. It's because they're just understanding that this is our collective conscience. Now that is true. In a family, it's true in a business, it's true in an organization, but it's true in a nation. We have a collective conscience in this nation. Let me give you some examples. Uh, for instance, let, let me start out easy and then we'll, we'll kind of work from there. For instance, in, in, our, in our country, let's say, how many of you would, would do this, okay? If you were in the car and you had this big bag of trash, you know, your family went through to Wendy's or McDonald's or, or your friends were with you, had a big bag of trash, and you, how many of you say, 
even though I know there are laws against, but let's say there's no laws, okay? No laws, no no repercussions. How many of you say I would not throw that? I would not roll the window down and throw that bag of trash out. How many of you say I would still not do that in the midst of that? Why? Why wouldn't you? Why? You say because it's it's wrong. It's just it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it's not wrong everywhere in the world. There are places in the world you can go. People walk into a store, they buy a candy bar, and they're walking out, and guess what they're doing? They're peeling the wrapper off, and guess where that's going? That's going on the ground because there's so much trash there. They don't even, they don't even realize. It's trash all over the world. It's not wrong to them. But in our country, we have this national conscience that says, you ought to not what? Throw a bag of trash out the window when you're driving down the street, right? There's something a little bit deeper. The anti-slavery movement in the United States and England was fueled by conscience. There were laws about slavery. And those laws got changed and because eventually people realized, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but they realized this, this, is, this shouldn't how, how it should be. This, we should not treat people like this. The civil rights movement was a conscious movement where people decided, black and white leaders decided this, we should not treat people like this. Our current laws in this country that govern abortion. Abortion is legal in every state in our country today. But how it's managed and how it's handled is different in every state, depending upon the tolerance of people. See, we've come to the point where we said, okay, okay we're going to have abortion in this country, and um, I may not be okay with that, but, you know, that's, you know, I, I don't, you know, that, I don't agree with that personally, but, you know, that may happen. A woman may decide that it's between her and her God and her doctor and all that. So that, we, I'm, I'm against that personally, but that's something that we, as this country said, okay, we can tolerate that. But our conscience says, now listen, once a, a mother has a baby, uh, now she can't decide whether that baby's going to live or, or die then. We, we, that is a ought not to, Right? And wherever abortion is allowed, it's not a medical issue. It's not a scientific issue. It is a conscious decision. That's why it's different in every different state that we have. And that's why the line moves depending upon the tolerance of people. Child pornography. <laughs> You're like, really? I mean, do we even have to have a law? I mean, you know, pictures of children and videos of young children. That... That's just wrong. Why, why is it wrong? It's not wrong in every country. You go to some countries today, that's acceptable. It's because we have a national conscience that says that is a ought not to. It's against the law here for a man to marry an 11 year old girl. You're like, that's wrong. Do we even have to have a law about that? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, running with scissors in your mouth. I mean, that's obvious, right? <laughs> that's not obvious all around the world. There are some countries where that's, that's, that's okay. It's not wrong. But we say it, it, it's wrong. We, I'm not saying everybody, but collectively, we would say that is one of those things as a national conscience, we would say, uh-uh, 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 that, that, no, that's, that's an ought not to, ought not to. Uh, a man can't have three wives in our country. Well, why not? Well, he said, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. By the way, you ever, you ever notice this? This, this? this is a side thing. Let me, let me go to it and then I'll come back. You ever notice there's never a woman that wants more than one husband? But anyway, that's true. But anyway, that's... <laughs> observation. Observation. All right, let's come back. Come back. Come back. All right, so we say uh, a man can't have more than... than can't have three wives. That's just wrong. Why? Why do we say it's wrong? Well, you know, in the Bible, the Bible's not a good place to go if you're going to, you know, that's not really a good place to go for that, okay? Because collectively as a nation, we said, that's wrong. That's an ought not to. Legalization of drugs is a conscious issue. Now, we have laws against that, but they are driven by conscience. What they're driven by. Child labor laws. We say, of course, kids that are six years old or kids that are seven or ten or whatever the case may be, 
that they should not be working and they should be working in certain environments. That's just wrong. Why? Why is that wrong? See, we go into some countries around this world and that's okay. And we go in there and we say, when we see children working, we say, that is an abuse of what? Human rights. And they say, that's, that's what you Americans <coughs> think, but that's not what we think. This is wrong, we say. See, we have a collective national conscience. I'm not saying that with that, that we all agree, but there's a general sense that you don't throw trash out the window when you're driving down the street. We don't have child pornography. There's just a natural conscience that says, here are things that we ought to do and things that we ought not to do. Just like you have a personal conscience, a family, and an organizational conscience. Now, let me say two things more about conscience. One is that when there's a shared collective conscience, when you've got this shared collective conscience, there's not a need for laws and rules. For instance, you ever been part of a great marriage, you've seen a great marriage, there are no rules in a great marriage. You don't sit down and say, now, now here's the thing you're supposed to do, and here's the thing I'm supposed to do, because they just understand there's a shared conscience that there's things that you ought and ought not to do. If you ever been part of a great family, there are not a lot of rules in a great family because they just understand. Here we understand. We have this shared conscience that says, here's the things that we ought to do. Here's the things that we ought not to do. And when somebody steps out of that, it's so obvious. Now, when there's a shared conscience, there's not a lot of need for rules. Now, here is the reason, the primary reason that we have a legal system that is so complicated and getting more complicated all the time is because we don't have this shared conscience anymore. We're losing it. It's eroding big time. And here's the thing is, when you play that out to the end, here's what's going to happen. When you tend to play that out and you see it out to the end, what happens is, no longer what is going to determine what's right and wrong is no longer the human heart. We will no longer determine this. That's an ought and an ought to. That will be determined by the court. And if we say, well, I think that's right, and the court says that's wrong, or we say that's wrong, and the court says that's right, it's going to be right. And we've seen that already. Now. But the thing is, when you have a shared conscience, there's not a lot of need for, for rules. The second thing is this, when it comes to conscience. A conscience has to be informed. Why is it, if I was in the car with you today, going down the road, we're going down, let's just go down 35, okay, and we, you, you've got a bag of trash sitting there. So you've got a bag of trash, and I said, hey, throw that out. <laughs> let's just throw it out. There's no law against it. Let's just throw it out the window. Why would you cringe? Why do you cringe? Because somebody taught you what? You don't throw trash don't out the door, right? Yeah, don't mess with Texas, exactly. <laughs> But you don't throw trash out the door. You don't throw it out the window, right? You don't do that. You were taught that. You know why? You ever had kids before? Been around kids before? Two-year-old gets something, takes the wrapper off, and what do they do with it? Oh, they walk right over to the trash can and go, this can't go on the floor. No. You tell them, pick that up, and what? Put it in the trash because conscience has got to be something that has to be informed. Dr. Bible, we're going to look at one scripture today. We're going to look at a bunch next week. We're going to look at one today. This, this is really two parts as well. We're going to do part one today and part two next week. But we're going to look at just one scripture today. This is a scripture in Romans chapter two where the Apostle Paul talks about the Gentiles. And the Gentiles did not have the law. So they just had the human heart. So basically what Paul's talking about is See, we all have this conscience. We're born with a conscience of what's right and what's wrong. And then what happens is you get information put into that conscience. Okay? For the Jews, it was the law that God put into that. So he talks about the Gentiles. Here's what he says. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things required by the law, they are the law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. It's kind of a, a complicated way of saying it is, they have within them this conscience of doing what's right and what's wrong to begin with. We're all born with that. 
Since they show that the requirements of law are written on their hearts, their consciences always bear witness, also bear, bearing witness. Their thoughts now accusing and now even defending. Here's, this is the role of the conscience. Defends, accuse, defends, accuse, defends, accuse. You're born with a conscience, and then what happens is you get information put into that. And then along comes, and you have a decision to make. And your conscience comes along and either defends you and says, hey, that's, okay, you can do that. Or it accuses you, goes, ah, 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 don't do that. But that's what happens. The conscience has to be informed. Now, here's my question. What is it that has informed our national conscience? What began when we, this country started, and what has continued on, what, what has been the thing that has informed our national conscience? Here's the answer. The answer is a sense of personal and corporate accountability of God created. When we started this country and continued on, here's what it was. The sense of we are personally accountable to God, and we are corporately together accountable to God the Creator, and we have this gratitude toward Him. Now, understand me, please understand me. I'm not arguing for the fact that all the founding fathers saw God as equal. Some of them had a completely different, as we view God as this God of Creator and a relationship, some of them had, didn't have that view at all. Some of them did not look at the Bible in a literal way. Some of them didn't look at it in, in a way that they really considered much worth of it at all. But collectively, they had this sense that in their national conscience, they said, here's what we believe, that we are grateful to God and that we personally and corporately are accountable to Him. Let, let me read something that's going to go up on the screen. This is a quote. You, you, you probably read this and memorized this in school. Where's this from? Where's this quote come from? Okay, Declaration of Independence. Okay, there you go. Okay, so here it goes. It goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, listen, that's another way of saying, uh, several years ago, there was a phrase used by younger folks. It's not used a lot now, but it was this phrase of, let me try to illustrate it. I, if I said, hey, there's a wall. Look at that. There's a wall. And they'd say, well, no, duh, right? I mean, it's obvious. And that's their way of saying it, is we hold these truths to be the self-evident. This is, it's obvious. This is, this is obvious truth, is what we know. That all men are created equal. We're, we're all on the same page. We're, we're all on the same you know, level playing field throughout. They are all endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So here's, here's the truth. Truth is, we're all created by God. We're all equal. Person on my right, person on my left. We're all equal. We're given certain rights by God the creator. Here's some of those rights. Life. Liberty, which is basically freedom, and what? The pursuit of happiness. And so here's what they said, is We're going to start a nation. In fact, we have to start a nation. We have to break off from England because of this conscious belief that we have. That we believe that, that God has created us this way. We're all equal. We're all the same. And we've all got these certain rights. And we're not able to live that out through this nation of England. So we're going to break off. We're going to start a war. And the Revolutionary War was a war of conscience. Not only that, but one of the primary reasons for it was a war of conscience. Because people said, we consciously have to do this. Now, the hypocrisy of the Revolutionary War was slavery. <laughs> but here's the thing. Not long after that ended, this same language was used and leveraged in order for people to say this. This is right. What we're doing to the black man and black woman, I mean, here we are. We say is, we have this national conscience that says is, hey, all men are created equal. And they're all given certain rights by the creator God. And those rights are for life, liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. And what we're doing to the black people, that's not right. Therefore, a war came. Called what? Civil War. And it was over a lot of things. But primarily, listen, primarily it was a war of conscience. A little bit later on, Abraham Lincoln, as in the Gettysburg Address, here's what he says. 
<laughs> that we here, highly resolved that these dead, he's looking over the battlefield there, shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of what? Freedom. He uses the phrase under God. Here's what I want you to notice. He is not afraid to be able to say, listen, our nation, our country is under the authority of God. That we are under His authority. We're accountable to God, collectively, personally accountable to God. And He did that when He was talking about a political issue. Then in the 1950s, came along, and in the Pledge of Allegiance was inserted two words. The words were under God. And now what it said is, okay, we, we're going to pledge allegiance to this country, and more importantly, what we're saying is, we're saying is, in this, we're saying we are accountable to God as a national uh, country and, and, and in our consciousness, we believe that personally and corporately we are accountable to God. 1956, then, something happened. Uh, we got a new motto. The 84th Congress did this. They declared we have a new model. President Eisenhower signed the law on July 30th, 1956. Now, a motto is this. Motto is just a phrase, you know, something, you know, a company. Uh, for instance, if you work for Home Depot, um, they have a motto. And the motto is this. You can do it. What is it? We can help. Yes, you can do it. We can help. Chick-fil-A has one. Chick-fil-A, you, you, all you will know this. I know you don't, know what, you don't work for Chick-fil-A, but you know it, right? It is eat for... Chicken, that's right, that is our motto. In 1956, the Congress, the Congress, what were they thinking? Said, our national motto will be, in God we trust. A shorter way to say that is, we trust God. Even a shorter way is to say, we trust God, we trust, trust God. Now, let's take it, Sarah. School's out, but it's coming in ground. Let's take this fall, and here comes this fall, and every school in this country, um, let's, elementary school, preschools, secondary schools, middle schools, everywhere, the principal gets on the loudspeaker at the beginning of the day and says, now kids, before we start this day, I just want you to remind you of our national motto. In God we trust. We trust God. Oh my gosh. You think your TV blew up this week? It would blow up completely. You'd have lawsuits and people saying, you can't do that. I mean, separation of church and state, and you can't, you can't do all these things. There's no way you can do that. We said, well, it's just our national model. I don't care if it's our national model. And that's the thing. We've gone so far that it's, it's strange for us to even talk about that in the, in the public world. So, so what? God is still God. What, what, what difference does this really make? God is still God. I mean, God will still do what God wants to do. What difference does it make about our national conscience? I mean, what difference does that really make? I mean, and even for my kids, my kids can hear that somewhere else. What, what difference does that make? Here's what it is. Here's the big thing. The big thing is that, you see, we have... We started this country and continued on, and we're led by this idea that we have a national conscience. That's what it is. And it is tied to this idea that God is the one that we're grateful to, and God is the one that we are accountable to personally and accountable to Him personally and corporately. And now we're going to say is that we believe that the God creator created everybody and we're all on equal plane. And we all have this idea that we are going to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's all going to happen. So we're going to have a, a we're country based on that. So if we take that away, if that's what it's tied to, what is, what's going to replace that? See, if it's all tied to that thought of God being the one we're grateful to, the one that we're accountable to personally and corporately, and we say, okay, well, let's... We, we don't need that anymore. Let's replace it with something. What, what's going to replace that? What are we going to replace it with? See, in, a, in our country, we have, we're having debates now, but it's going to come down to two groups of people. And on one side, there are going to be people who are going to say, 
I may sound odd to you, but listen, I still believe that I'm grateful to God for everything that I have, and I'm still grateful to Him. And I believe, I know you may think I'm weird, I'm narrow-minded, whatever the case may be, but I believe that we are, I'm personally accountable to God, and we are corporately accountable to God. And there's going to be people on the other side that said, nah, I don't think so. Uh, we're grateful. Um, I don't know who, I guess, I guess just to me, I'm grateful to me, and I'm not accountable to anybody else except for just me. I'm not accountable to anybody else. One of the things that baffles us, I think, from time to time is that when we see people stand up, politicians particularly, and they stand up and they say, I, I want to lead you. I, I want to do this. And yet they have something in their life that is totally unacceptable to us. In fact, when, it, when we find that out, what do we say to them? We're like, okay, cross his name off the list, her name off the list, because that, they're completely gone because it's not acceptable. We're like, how do you do that? How do you stand up and say to people, I want to lead you, you should follow me, but this thing that I have in my life is just totally unacceptable. It's because there's no accountability. I'm not accountable to anybody in my life. See, think of it like this. Think of how you lived before you were accountable to God, before you realized it. You, you just thought, it's, it's all about me, <laughs> and I'm accountable to me, and I just, and you know, it's just all, whatever I want to do, I will do, you know, I'll do whatever. And then how things change, your thinking change, your view of life change, when you realize, I'm accountable to God. One of these days, there's going to be a day of reckoning. One of these days, there's going to be a day that, that I'm accountable personally and corporately, we're accountable to God, how much things change in that time. We're either going to be a nation of gratitude to God and accountability to Him, or not grateful anybody and not accountable to anyone. Now, I understand how sensitive this is. I understand how offensive it is to people. And I understand the whole separation of church and state and how that's been blown out of the point. But here's what's at stake. What is at stake for you and I is this. is the idea that, see, our country began and it continued on with this idea that we have a national conscience of what we ought and ought not do. And it was tied to the idea that we are grateful to God and we are accountable to God personally and corporately. And if that is not there anymore, before we remove God from that picture, we better figure out what's going to go in the middle of there. Because we don't really have an idea of what's going to happen when we remove God from that conversation. We do have a hint of it. And here's the hint. If you were to study countries in the past and even the present who said, when it comes to us in our national, their national conscience, so to speak, and they said, God is, God's not even part of this picture. We're not even going to allow part of him. And they said, we're, he's not even going to be tied. He's not even going to be part of this picture. What you will find is that life Liberty and the pursuit of happiness has gone out the window in that. And so here's that's where we face with, with ours. Is before we say, God, you're out of the picture, we better figure out what that is. Because right now what we're doing is we're just hoping that something's going to be as compelling as God. And I'm afraid that's not going to work out for us too well. All right. Let me give you homework. Then I'm going to give you some application. I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to let you go home. Okay, so here's, here's what we're going to do, because we're going to do part two next week. Here's what I encourage you to do. First of all, for you, some of you people like to get on a computer, and you like to be on a computer and search and look for all this stuff, or whatever the case may be, you've got too much time in your hands. No, but anyway, some of you like that, you're not people first. So here's what I do. just go back and look. Look, just try to find the last time we had a president, the last time we had a president, who prayed out loud publicly, didn't read, I'm not talking about just reading the script, I'm talking about who prayed out loud publicly or published a prayer, okay? Second of all, for you that don't want to do that, some of you are more people, you know, people you want to talk to people and ask them, just ask people this week when you're at your work or neighborhood or whatever, so just say, hey, do you know, you know, it's 4th of July and I'm just, I got asked this question the other day, do you know what the national motto is? You'd be surprised what people say, you know, it's like, Takes one to know one, you know. But just, just ask people, you know, what, 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 do you, 
what is the national motto? If you don't want to do, you don't want to do either one. Here's what I'd ask you. I would ask you to do this. I would ask you to do this. It's just begin to view things with kind of this filter. And notice how absent it is, the God talk. We talk about anything to do with politics. Anything to do with them. Let me give you application. Two things, and I'll speak to generally, and I'll speak to a specific group. One is, it's here what I say to you generally, is you need to look at your sphere of influence, whether it's just your mom, it's my kids, um, it's within my work, it's within my family, my neighborhood, whatever the case may be. And not to be offensive to people, but just to be able to say, say to people is, listen, I know you may think I'm weird, <laughs> I know you may think I'm narrow-minded, but I still believe that we as a country, we've got to be grateful to God. Even though we might not see all see God as the same way, we might not see the Bible saying, we need to be grateful to God, and we are, I'm personally accountable to God. And I think corporately, we're accountable to God as well. The second thing I would say is to a particular group of you, and that is uh, older, more mature people. <laughs> is that a polite way to put it? And I would say to you, you really need to pray about this. You need to pray because, see, you, you, many of you have enjoyed the benefits of growing up in a country in which we had people and leaders who understood that as a national conscience that we are grateful to God and that we are accountable to God personally and corporately. And you, you reap some of the benefits in that. But for your kids, and not so much for your kids, your grandkids and your great-grandkids, that I'm not sure is going to be around if God doesn't do something. But it's going to take an act of God. And so I would say to you, you need to pray and ask God to do something, God. We need you to do something. In order that we as a people and we as our leaders would again look to you and say, we don't maybe you see God... All on the same page, not the Bible on the same, but at least we understand, we have this national kind of, we understand that it is tied to the idea that God, we're grateful to you, and that we are personally and corporately accountable to you and you alone, God. Now, God, God will act with that. And the way God usually acts, when I look throughout the Old Testament, I look throughout the kind of history of the Bible. Here's the way God usually does that. Sometimes he does that because people pray. People got asked and God answers that prayer. Sometimes what God does, he causes a national calamity. You know, for Israel, he would do that. And people would be like, oh, I guess we do need God. Here's, I, don't, here's, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying go home and say, God, send something awful to our country. Don't do that. Let God be God. All I'm saying is, I would implore you. To be in prayer and to say, God, we need you to do something. We need you. Here's a little secret. I know we love our country. But God doesn't need us. We need him. And if there was ever a time, Lord, that we needed God and we asked less, is this it? And so I would just say to you, is pray. And say, God, do something. Whatever it is, you do so. Let's pray. And then we're going we're gonna to close. And we go.